Uh, today's speaker, Greg Johnson, is with Parametric Investments. Um, he's uh, responsible for supporting development and distribution of their products. Uh, prior to joining Parametric, he was with Wellington as Vice President and Investment Director of Product Management. Um, he also worked uh, previously as a Senior Investigator for Chicago Board Options Exchange and as a Derivatives Trader. Got an MBA from University of Chicago, Bachelor of Science from Economics uh, from the University of Minnesota. Uh, he's also a CFA charter holder. I'd like to turn it over to Greg to tell us about emerging markets. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much for the, uh, the introduction. Wow. Um, so, hello, fellow charter holders. I've got about 35 minutes of comments today. Thank you for the courage to come to listen to uh, a talk about the emerging markets. Today, I would say there's, there's really a lot more probably fear than greed in terms of how people are viewing the asset class these days. And you know, when I've been looking at that, I don't know what you want to call it, your sort of quilt chart of equity asset class returns by calendar year or the periodical table of those asset classes, you know, I think back at, through the 2000s emerging markets, was really hitting the top of the charts there year after year, and then it kind of fell off the charts for the last maybe about five years or so. Um, and I think, you know, maybe the eyes come off the asset class. As I uh, talk with uh, clients and prospects in our emerging markets approach, you know, they're starting to ask a little bit about, gosh, should I stay or should I go? Uh, in, in the asset class, and I think I'm hearing that in, in conversation. So I thought, you know, for this 35 minutes or so, I'd like to kind of revisit the asset class, revisit the case for it, share with you some of the characteristics that we see uh, in, the, in the asset class that, in, that includes the frontier markets, and then kind of step through exposures that, that, that we get to the asset class, um, and then wrap up with a quick bit on kind of how we think about uh, approaching uh, the markets um, in this part of the world. So real quick, Parametric, uh, and I spoke with a few of you before we started. You might know of Parametric. Uh, we were based in Seattle, been around uh, quite a while. Uh, we have about 150 million, uh, billion under management. Um, you might know us through our tax uh, managed strategies. We have about 40 billion that we do for clients there in separate accounts. That's probably what maybe a number of you know of us there. We also manage about 15 billion, about 10 billion of that or so in emerging markets in the strategies we call systematic alpha. And then we've got a group uh, out of Minneapolis that does a lot of overlay and options work for clients that kind of takes care of the rest of, of the AUM and notional dollars. So we've got a variety of approaches to the markets. What's common across Parametric is that we're predominantly rules-based in what we do. We really don't have any form of market views. We're not incorporating fundamental work into what we do. We're not incorporating uh, multi-factor models that we might uh, generate through quant research to help score stocks for investing. Uh, we're much more structured, disciplined, and, and you'll kind of see that at the very end what we do. Um, and so, you know, kind of going right into this, when, when we think about uh, the asset class, there really are a few things that the emerging markets have going for it. Um, these are fairly well-established consensus views, but these are longer-term trends that are there, and they should pay off again at some point in time. And if, if you think about it, you know, the, the GDP uh, percentage coming from the emerging and the frontier world is now over half of, of, of global GDP. So there's, you know, the, the dominance of economic growth uh, coming from that part of the world uh, can't be overlooked. Um, the population, the vast percentage of the population is in this part of the world. And within that trend, that demographic trend, uh, are hundreds of millions of individuals that are starting to come into the work cohort over the next decades. You've got essentially a very, very, very large, you know, sort of baby boom uh, segment of the population coming into the workforce. And so that's one of the trends that's identified as potential driver for as these countries are continuing on their path of development, you've got people that have uh, the ability to get into the workforce, uh, to have some money in their pockets. So there's this whole concept of some greater consumerism to happen there and this idea of an emerging middle class that you know, we're seeing signs of in different pockets of that part of the world. 
That's a very real and a very uh, real trend and potential growth coming from there. And then, you know, this has always been the case, but, you know, that's where most of the land is, and it's still resource rich, and a lot of these countries have yet to really do uh, a lot of uh, infrastructure build out in those countries. So there's quite a bit of potential, quite a bit of opportunity in terms of longer trend opportunities that are in, in, in the space um, that, again, we have yet to be sort of paid off uh, in terms of our equity investments on in the last you know few years or so. And then just in terms of its, if its profile in, in the equity world, if we look at the all country world index, the MSCI kind of broad global index, you know, emerging markets now is, you know, a neutral weight, there's about 10%. Um, and so, you know, that's something that we think should be a strategic allocation for clients. Um, most of my conversations, clients, you know, if they're there are maybe 5%, some are around 10, some are, are much more aggressive and go a bit higher than that. Uh, but, you know, it's got a place in the world markets and, you know, that number has, has grown over the last decade. From another perspective, if we look at valuations, and, and someone mentioned this that I, I spoke to, um, you know, at, at the outset, um, was looking at sort of, you know, uh, the valuations, and, and sort of by, by most any measure here, the emerging markets, uh, sort of the fourth one in there, the EM index is cheap on a price to earnings basis. I think that's 12 months trailing. Uh, we've got the MSCI Frontier Index, that's even a little bit cheaper relative to some of these other PEs. So, you know, and from a valuation perspective, one of the cheaper or cheapest uh, equity asset classes there. Similarly, on price to book, you know, uh, quite competitive dividend yield. Um, and then you've got kind of a volatility measure. And then, you know, if we think about cyclically adjusted PEs, um, you know, in terms of kind of relative to a couple other asset classes. So if I look at kind of that CAPE measure at the end of the year for the Emerging Market Index, that's at 10.1. Um, that's way below its 10-year average of 17.7. So that's quite far below its 10-year its average. Uh, looking at uh, the MSCI world, that CAPE at the end of the year was 15.5, and that's you know, moderately below its 10-year average of, of 20. Um, and then if we look at the U.S. at the year at the year end, that CAPE was at 22.1, and that's just, uh, I'd say, moderately above its 10-year CAPE of 19.4. Of so from a couple different perspectives, uh, the asset class is cheap in the emerging markets. That hopefully does get recognized at some point in time. Um, and so low valuations coupled with the growth prospects, we think sort of meaningful growth potential, um, you know, generally indicates that there's potential, you know, for some significant long-term price appreciation back in the emerging markets. Yeah. Why is the emerging market small cap so much higher than the small cap? The last two columns, did I read that right? Yeah, it looks like the, you know, the PE is much higher in the EM small cap index than, um, than the EFA small cap index. Um, interesting, I mean, the, the um, you know, that's, that's interesting. I don't know what the drivers, the MSCI EM small cap country profile is quite a bit different, I know, um, than the EM country index profile. But that, that's a good question. There's a pretty big, pretty big difference there in, in EM small cap PEs, much higher. So looking at some of the characteristics, if you kind of think about the characteristics of the asset class, when we look at this, um, you know, there's kind of three things that have been in place for, for a decade or so in terms of, you know, by country you've got highly volatile assets, country volatility, uh, the correlation's quite low across these countries, we'll come more back to that later. Um, you know, arguably the, the information there relative to the developed markets tends to be potentially more unreliable, different in counting standards, the quality of the data, the history of the data there for the quants is, is, is less established, there's better, uh, more reliable data in the developed markets, um, and, you know, certainly higher transaction costs, uh, especially as you move away from the bigger, more developed emerging market countries and off into the frontier markets, get to be quite expensive to trade are some of the characteristics of, of looking to get exposure in this space. 
Uh, and then we would note that you know when you start looking at the country composition of the index, you tend to have quite large concentrations. So you've got right now about 80% of your exposure in this space uh, in just eight of the countries. Uh, back you know in the mid 90s, Mexico was 25% of the index. Malaysia was 25% of the index back in the mid 90s. So these concentrations have the potential to to build and collapse, you know, Brazil used to be about a double of that not that long ago in the index, and that's receded. Uh, so there's volatility and, and some issues maybe in terms of how uh, diversified your exposure is when, when you look at just the cap-weighted index. Um, and then, you know, there tends to be somewhat of a, you know, kind of a line that MSCI tends to draw. Certainly they've got to make a decision who's a frontier market, who's a developed market. Um, and you know the, the, the thesis, whether it's uh, developed or front or emerging or frontier, is similar in terms of um, you know the, the, the GDP growth, the, the populations and demographics, and the geographic coverage. Um, you know the frontier markets obviously are going to have tend to be lower economic output. They tend to have sort of greater reliance on human capital and technology. Uh, the populations tend to be more rural. The economies are more focused domestically. Um, capital markets tend to be less sophisticated. The MSC's got some specific things that designate, you know, what a frontier market is. They need, you know, at least two securities on the exchange. They need some level of, of capital markets function before they'll start to look at a frontier market for inclusion uh, in their frontier index. Um, but, um, you know, the risks are also much lower liquidity um, in that space. And there's, you know, another level up in terms of political risk or government instability. Um, there's some foreign investor restrictions that can occur in some of the frontier markets. Uh, but as we'll see, you know, that's a segment of the world uh, that's worthy of consideration and, and I think fits under the umbrella of, of this whole asset class uh, potential. Now when we look at you know, the, the asset class from a risk perspective, you know, it's interesting if we look at five-year standard deviations, um, no surprise that Greece is kind of leading the, the pack with about a 45 uh, you know, uh, standard deviation by comparison, the EFA standard deviation that's not on here is 15, and the S&P the last five years at a, is at 11.7. Uh, so, in, you know, in, in contrast, you've got higher volatility um, in the emerging market countries as you work down the list. You kind of your lower uh, standard deviations are, are Malaysia and Taiwan, uh, with the index at about 17.8. Um, but it's interesting that the frontier market standard deviations are really not that much different from some of the emerging market countries. Certainly Argentina has gone through a ton of volatility that's up there on par with Greece. Uh, and then things actually start to go down and dip down a bit lower um, if you look at Mauritius or Morocco or Kuwait in terms of standard deviations. And that frontier index standard deviation is actually closer to the S&P standard deviation um, at 11.9 in the last five years. So while individually you can have you know, higher volatility per country in the space, um, uh, this chart is uh, great for an eye exam. I would just kind of look at the colors here. But when we look at the, the correlations of all these countries, and we've got them listed from really the largest, most liquid emerging market countries, uh, at, at parametric, we kind of group these accordingly if you see some tier words there. But as you work down the page, you're going uh, from top to bottom, from the larger, more liquid EM countries down into, as you get uh, into this area here on down, are going to be all frontier market countries. And as you go from left to right, the same profile, larger, more liquid EM all the way down to frontier. And as you go, if you, if you could see the the cross correlations there of each of the countries versus themselves um, in the last five years. You know, the correlations are starting fairly moderate in about the 0.7 range. And then as the colors lighten as we go down the page, you know, all these frontier market countries with, with everybody else are around the 0.3 or 0.4 level for correlation, which is very low for long only equity. So there's a very big diversification benefit um, as you start to move down. Um, and away from the more developed uh, emerging market countries. And essentially, um, you know, we can show that um, through another way in a, in a chart or two. But as you get further segmented from the global capital markets, you're going to start to experience that diversification benefit of the lower cross-correlation um, of, of those country returns. 
And you know, I think it's striking to see what the reversals can be like in this space. It's another kind of characteristic of the market. You know, kind of these are just examples, kind of back to back uh, reversals in a country return. Um, you know, the first one here, you've got Thailand from 2003 was up almost 150 percent, um, and then was flat the next year. You've got some other reversals here from up one year to strongly down uh, the next. Um, you know, last year uh, we had, uh, you know, Mal Indonesia was up 27% in 2014, was down about 20% in 2015. Uh, and then on the other side of the page, you've got, again, sort of big uh, losers to winners reversals back to back years. So a lot of volatility that can occur in a country return. These aren't individual stock returns, but you can get, you know, 100% moves uh, in these country returns in back to back years. You know, Hungary last year was down, uh, was up 36%, but was down uh, almost that same amount in 2014. So uh, unpredictable and, and what can be very fast and strong moves at a country level, again, um, amplifying that volatility and potential for, for low cross correlations if that can be captured. So in, in looking to capture, what we have is the backdrop of the markets. You know, let's talk about a few you know, kind of straightforward ways that, that, that uh, all of us can, can kind of get some of this market exposure. And I think what's interesting is if we look at some uh, MSCI BARA data. So here we've got, you know, pushing, oh, I think it's 19. So let's, you know, round, let's say roughly 20 years of data. Now what you're looking at here, if you think about your BARA information, if we take and decompose things, we can get country factor, we can get industry factor. And then we're going to lump the bar of styles into one grouping, and that would be your, you know, your growth value, size, uh, size linearity, all those kind of bar of style factors will lump those risk factors. And if we look to decompose the cross-sectional volatility of the EFA IMI index, so we're looking at essentially that uh, that cross-sectional volatility calculation to give a measure of dispersion of stock returns in the space, and we can decompose that. Uh, source of risk and then assign it uh, a contribution by country, industry, and style, let's say. And when we do that, when we look at the EFA information, you know, you tell me, but these three components, these three levers, country, industry, style, tend to trade places. So if you're building a portfolio in developed space, in EFA, international, you will need to be careful and cognizant of, of your country, your industry, and your, and your stock or style positioning uh, in order to capture the, the risk and, and the return potential in the space. Um, as we look at the same decomposition going over to emerging, we get a very different picture um, when we look at these elements. And, and there's some academic work by, uh, by Beckert and Harvey that go into this in one of their papers. Uh, but here you see really, you know, quite strongly over time, the country factor is the dominant uh, explanatory factor for that risk in this space, followed by a drop down of industry and then style. You did get kind of a, a, a pop in style, essentially, um, in size and volatility in a big risk on risk off uh, trade in 2011. I think that's what we're told is kind of why that style pops up so strongly there and then reverts back. But you know, if you're, if you're thinking about the emerging markets, these are countries that are still fairly segmented from the global capital markets. Uh, some of them are progressing. That's why there's a little bit of a trend line in country declining if you really want to try and draw a line there as the countries become more integrated this country component becomes less of a factor, but still across the emerging markets, that country component, there's higher political risk, there's higher credit risk, there's, there's varying levels of inflation, uh, there's you know, potential for um, different market regulations that are all country level components tend to be the bigger driver of what's moving the stocks or explaining the dispersion of returns in that space. So looking at this chart, you'd argue, well, if you're going to build a portfolio in emerging markets, you've got to be very careful about where your country allocation is, and there's going to be less impact from industry uh, and style, it would suggest. Uh, you know, eventually, we expect industry to be more meaningful in, in that component, and that trend line is occurring, and we're starting to see that, again, in some of the bigger developed emerging countries where sector is more meaningful. Uh, 
So with that, you know, as we go into this, we can certainly, uh, this is a topic for its own lunch, and I'm sure you've done this before, you know, just to kind of do a drive-by, you know, in terms of exposures to the markets, um, you know, one way to kind of capture this in the emerging market space is to go passive. And, you know, there's always going to be some pros and cons. Some of these pros, you could argue, are cons and vice versa, depending on what firm or, or view you have for your clients. Um, but, you know, in general, you know, cap-weighted indices, a lot of folks point out that concentration risk. If you're looking for capturing the growth in this whole part of the world in emerging markets, you know, do you want 26% in China driving your your exposure and, and the top three countries being a big component of that. One of them arguably already developed at FTSE is the one who's building your passive index. Um, and you know, I'd say sort of in terms of fixed published methodology, that's, it's out there, the, the, the rules for the passive methodologies are well known. Um, they tend to be fairly slow to you know, adopt to evolution in the marketplace. MSCI may take a year or two to get Saudi Arabia in the index when they opened their markets for foreign investment last June. So, um, you know, that could be taken as, as a potential negative. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the purpose here is to capture the market return. And with that, there's a positive. You've got low implementation costs, you've got low turnover, you've got low fees to look to cap capture that market return. And, 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 you know, maybe that's a positive to say you're going to accept the market consensus and the market return and the market risk. Uh, and that's one way to go about getting exposure. Um, through that means, you can flip to the other side and look for potential to outperform. Some individuals want to spend their risk budget in the emerging markets and look to identify a manager that's going to outperform the index. Um, that's going to come with a cost. There's higher turnover, higher transaction costs, higher <coughs> manager fees. Arguably, do they have the the, the resources or the skill to kind of navigate different accounting standards and to kind of root out uh, what would be accurate or quality information for, for making, you know, what would be more of a conviction-weighted decision. You know, you've got uh, process and you've got security selection and tactics that's going to look to add value uh, in this space. Some folks feel that this is quite inefficient in this marketplace and that there's a lot of opportunity. Um, you need to be right with that conviction. Um, and there's going to be focused on this areas of perceived value. So again, it's you know, uh, decision to find a good manager who's good at what they do to add value, um, and that would be you know another way to kind of approach your uh, your decision to allocate in the emerging. And then you know then we've got something that starts to be a bit kind of in between. So smart beta has been the tagline. Um, that's a whole other topic in terms of if it's really um, the right tagline. Um, people take offense at smart beta, that means suggest something. Um, but, you know, if you think about it, people, since, especially since the global financial crisis, this has become a bit more of an option, and, you know, it tends to be kind of live in between. So you've got, you know, sort of index-like exposure. Um, they tend to have fairly rigid rules, again, methodology passively, uh, fairly strict adherence to what they're trying to do. Uh, which would be to create a strategy that's different than a cap-weighted index. That's really what smart data is when you boil it down. Um, and, you know, the way that you're going to do this between passive and active to look to beat the cap-weighted index, um, you know, might be something that's a factor indexing approach. You might say we're going to go small in value. That would be a form of a smart beta. Um, fundamental indexing, again, is a different way to think about the cap-weighted exposure. You've got diversity weighting, you've got different, you know, minimum ball, minimum variance, a uh, variety of ways you can capture it different than a cap-weighted exposure. Um, and because of that, you might have outperformance of the cap-weighted index. So it's a different, some people say it's not like true alpha, but nonetheless you could experience outperformance of the cap-weighted index in a fairly uh, disciplined fashion. Um, not very reactive to liquidity and transaction costs, and again, not very reactive to necessarily evolutions uh, in the marketplace. Um, and outperformance will really be based on your sort of acceptance of their construction methodology. But again, you know, it's a third way that uh, is presenting itself into, uh, into the emerging markets um, that, that's open for consideration. Um, and then, you know, if, if I kind of do a little bit on, on uh, parametric, um, you know, we look to take some of these thoughts of smart beta and improve on that further. We've been doing this since the mid-90s. 
Uh, so we've been doing this a long time. I think it you know, pre, predates the tagline smart data. Uh, but when we look into the emerging markets in a portfolio, we really want to actively reduce the concentration risk we see versus the benchmark. Um, we look to capture what we believe are the, really the persistent uh, elements of volatility, the persistent cross-correlation, low cross-correlation of these countries, um, and not incorporate really any market views. So we don't believe we can add value by having estimates of growth or we're looking to do fundamental research in what we do. And, and this structure of our portfolio, we believe, um, can get up and over the cap-weighted benchmark over time. Uh, but building into it what we do, consideration for the liquidity and consideration for the transaction costs in the space. Uh, and in short, you know, here's a graph of what we do. But you know, when we look at the cap-weighted index, and uh, if you can see the gray bars are the cap-weighted uh, weights of the EM index there, you know, from a philosophical standpoint, you know, if we're looking for max diversity in what we do and we like diversification, we're going to invest in EM and frontier market countries. Academic solution would be to equal weight those constituents. Um, if you don't have any conviction, if you don't know what's going to go up next year, again, equal weighting your constituents would be the way to go. And, and we look to capture that in what we do, but also be cognizant of the implementation. We can't go equal weight down in these frontier and, and lower liquidity emerging markets. So uh, we've arrived at a, a liquidity tier approach where we group countries by like liquidity and market cap and then equal weight those country exposures within these groupings. So we, as we move down in liquidity and market cap, we reduce our weights accordingly. So when we get down into the frontier markets, we may have 25 countries worth of frontier market exposure in this strategy, but we're only going to put about 3 quarters of a percent into each of those countries. There may only be 10 stocks that trade you know, on uh, the Bahrainian exchange or the Argentinian exchange, but we'll look to get small allocations into those. And over time, we believe we can capture the volatility across the space where the overall investment thesis lies. And when we've got, again, in terms of rule-based, where, where a country return goes up by a certain amount, uh, we hit a trigger and we go ahead and trade out of that country uh, on the strength of the returns that hit the trigger and really redeploy that capital in another country that's experienced weakness at that point in time. Again. Um, being sure to be, frankly, overly diverse by stock and, and diverse by sector so that we look to capture that country uh, effect and look to capture that country volatility and take advantage of the, the low correlations across, uh, across countries. And so, I'll leave that off, that's a little salesy, but you know, um, I'm about a half hour in, and that's kind of what I promised I would do um, in terms of my comments. Um, and so, uh, you know, we could open it up for some questions. Um, you know, I wanted to kind of go back and revisit briefly the case for the emerging markets, point out valuations. Um, you know, we've, we've just written a short piece on, you know, so you might say, okay, well, there's a few headwinds to this sort of unlocking some value in the emerging markets. We've had a very strong dollar rally uh, quite recently, um, and that's had a big impact when we look at, um, you know, the EM index was down about 15% calendar year 2015. Uh, if, you, if you sort of do that in a local currency, uh, it's about flat. So big currency impacts back to US dollar the last few years. Uh, the question is whether that is going to be sustained or do we see some reversion um, and get a bit of you know, sort of help or, or at least not such a detriment uh, in terms of the currency impact in this space. Um, you know, there's still big questions in terms of you know commodity pricing, et cetera, and the impact it has on, on these countries. You know, the index is a net, you know, if you look cap weighted, the index is a net oil importer um, that has some benefits in terms of some of the countries, but uh, the big exporters get hit hardest when you have those big shocks to the oil uh, pricing. So a lot of the big <coughs> exporters will really hit hard, and that's kind of been a shock to the system that has to maybe have some resolution. So there's a few things out there, I think, that are these sort of maybe shorter to intermediate headwinds to uh, hopefully people looking into the asset class and seeing it uh, as, as an opportunity like it had been uh, in the years past. Um, you know, the valuations sh sure are, are indicating that. Um, I would say in terms of positives, now the diversification benefit, back a while ago, the EM asset class was thought of as a nice diversifier in a portfolio. We did see correlations to develop countries go up 
almost to the level of 80, 90 percent in the global financial crisis, where they had been maybe 60, 40 to 60 percent in prior periods. Now, um, unfortunately, the divergence of returns helps with that profile. Now we're back down to that 50 to 60 percent correlation, uh, roughly uh, at the expense of the EM markets going down. Um, and the U.S. or developed markets essentially haven't gone up on, on a nice you know, three or four year run. So um, now the benefit is back on for diversification for the asset class. Um, and uh, so that's kind of uh, a few thoughts we have in terms of when we kind of look out into general research. These, you know, we don't have an economist at Parametric that's creating these to do some sort of channeling a bit of some of the research that, that others are producing and, and are some of the topics I think all of us are thinking about in terms of uh, putting together a mosaic for what the world will deliver us, you know, in the next one to five years or so. Uh, yeah. Given the the data that you showed us on the sudden reversals, has anybody ever looked at kind of a dogs of the Dow, you know, by the by the ten worst or twenty worst countries and seen whether that performance or that system might be successful? That's a great question, no, uh, but I think that's a very interesting uh, proposition. Um, I haven't seen any, any work like that. Um, you know, to, to say that, okay, we've identified, so we go, you know, if we go to those reversals and say, let's go back, let's look at, you know, year by year and kind of go into those that have depreciated the most, you know, there, that would be an interesting back test, frankly. Um, that's an interesting idea. Um, you know, that would have to be very rules-based. You know, if you, had, if you had seen Russia go down 50% in the fourth quarter of 2014, it took a lot of guts to go buy into Russia then. But if you had, Russia had a, a very strong reversal. I mean, Russia had a plus in front of it for a country return in 2015. Um, so there was about, you know, 60, 70% uh, from low to, to, to upwards there. So there, there are very powerful returns there, um, but it would have to be very meth methodical to try and capture that. And some things do go lower. Um, yeah? I noticed that you say in your sales pitch that you um, implement efficiency, efficiency, <coughs> excuse me. Um, what does your rebalancing, your asset rebalancing, um, cost you in terms of turnover and cost? And do you have a time frame for doing that? Do you say tomorrow or do you say two months or? Yeah, we have a we've 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 done some research on it. Our recent research, research um, so to answer your question, we have um, uh, event-based triggers. So we have, uh, um, if I just go back to um, these tiers, what we've arrived at is you know there's some proxy for transaction costs in liquidity. If you've got high liquid markets, transaction costs tend to be a bit lower. Um, in what is oftentimes a little bit imprecise to get really accurate transaction costs. We can pull all of our subcustodians and do our best to get accurate transaction cost data, but it's a little bit of a art and science to have reliable. So as a proxy for liquidity, we, we assign the triggers based on a country's tier assignment in, in this approach. Um, so a tier one country large liquid gets a 20% trigger. So Brazil, surprisingly, has gone up a lot this year so far. Um, that's going to be another reversal story. It was down about 40% last year. There's really no fundamental reason I can think of that Brazil's up uh, other than maybe a little bit of uh, uh, shaping up some commodity pricing, etc. But they've got a lot going on. Anyhow, Brazil gets a 20% trigger large liquid. If Brazil goes up, we've got a 6% target weight in our strategy. If Brazil hits 7.2, goes up 20%, it'll hit that trigger. Only then do we go into Brazil and take some proceeds out trade it back down to 6%, and that'll go to whichever country is most below its tier target weight at that point in time. So selling strength, bind to weakness. Um, it's only done when we hit that trigger. So our turnover in the strategy is low. It's about 10%. So that low, tr uh, low turnover is, helps ease on the implementation and the transaction costs. Uh, we're trading when we've had a burst of liquidity into a market, so we're kind of trading contrarian to the liquidity flow, putting capital to work in, in li low liquid markets, taking capital out of, of some higher liquidity markets. That helps ease a bit of our bid ask spread, I would say. Um, that's, that's essentially what we're trying to do there to kind of ease on, on that uh, cost side. Yeah. Uh, would it be possible to get a copy of your slides? 
I yeah, I think so. That's uh, Greg can get in contact with you. Okay. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the on the liquidity question, I, I don't think that there's any one of the things that we had, I recall correctly, 2015 EM small cap actually performed a little bit better than EM, which would be some of the valuation difference. One of the arguments that I've heard is that that was largely a liquidity issue, that, that there weren't a lot of investors, especially retail investors, in the EM small cap. Yeah. If we were to take kind of news items aside and, and look at volatility along these tiers, would we expect to see lower volatility in, in kind of the tier four and transition than tier one? Yes. Now, I think there's a fair amount of information in the trafficking in terms of the liquidity and the impediments to really trade effectively. Mm -hmm. um, so we start to get off the global capital market grid when we go into the frontier markets. Um, volumes drop, mm -hmm. trading drops, um, and you know investor capital flow. So the you know the frontiers tend to be potentially slower when there's events going on that are going to happen you know the big liquid guys are going to feel that from the developed kind of global news and it starts to trickle down but not really happening in the frontier markets what's going on there is more to do with you know trading for events that occur there I think um, so it's tricky to navigate uh, a strategy in the frontier markets because there's you've got to be very careful of, of your activity on, on average daily volumes and uh, round trip transaction costs, you know, in the EM markets can be from 50 basis points. This is sort of explicit, implicit estimates, you know, 50 basis points to maybe 6% in, in EM country round trip. And the numbers I hear in Frontier can be 2 to 10%. Um, so, uh, so to answer your point, yes, but I think there's a fair amount of, you know, lower volume and, and uh, tougher trading in that space that results in maybe lower standard deviation, frankly, um, when we look at those standard deviation charts. Uh, yeah. Uh, two questions. <clears throat> Are you still not, I think I heard you say something to the effect that because we don't have return expectations, there's certain people waiting in some of the countries for years. But that would also tend to mean you have no view about the return and correlation, the risk and correlations. But risk and correlation is a little more predictable, and so why not sort of reduce risk, even if you have no difference in return? Right, right. So, well, that could be, uh, that's a good question. So, uh, if I hear you correctly, you know, if we've got, you know, do we have some information with the volatility and correlation information that could possibly fine tune some of these weightings? And kind of say, hey, look, we've got a volatility opportunity, so we're going further overweight. Um, Brazil now or something. Um, that could be a strategy, uh, but again, I think we're kind of laying on top of that volatility and correlation, and I don't think we feel like we've got necessarily that type of uh, skill to kind of correctly pick those volatility instances, let's say. And on the ten of, pages 10 and 11, you mentioned some of the reversals and risk. I'm assuming these are all in U.S. dollars, and currency risk is, is a part of this? Yeah, we, we tend to uh, consider the currency uh, built into the country return. So those would be USD returns. Yes? I completely get the infrastructure argument that you made earlier on behalf of emerging markets because they have so long a long way to go. So even if China's slowing down, somebody else might be able to pick up some portion of that. But I'm trying to sort through the burgeoning middle class mm -hmm. argument, only because from Brazil and China and even the US, even though we're not an emerging market, you keep hearing about how the middle class is becoming smaller, and it's, it, there's income to, you know, inequality, I mean, which has been extreme in some of the emerging markets historically, which is why ISIS and some other things keep cropping up. So where, I mean, this is more of a governance issue perhaps, but yeah. do you see, that being resolved over the next 10 years, or what's the, is it, are we placing a bet on that? Right, right, right. right. I, you know, the, uh, you know, I think, I think sort of broader thematically, there's, there are sort of trends of, of, of people moving in 
and sort of clustering, so a, a sort of a, sort of a slow migration to some urbanization, I would say. And uh, you know, you've got some manufacturing that's been built out. So you've got people moving in to kind of get those jobs from their farmland. You know, if I think about you know to some extent China now. Um, at what point does that start to put money in that person's pocket that they're going to go into their drugstore and get aspirin? I mean, that's part of this premise is to say these folks are going to have jobs that are going to pay them a bit more, um, that there's a trend towards urbanization, and then this sort of growth of consumerism and some greater wealth. I think there's some movement in that, but I, but you know, there's going to be, I think, sort of fits and starts, I think, that we see in, in any number of countries. But I think as a collection, um, and, and certainly I think when, when you get into, um, you know, I think in, in looking at sort of 10-year sort of GDP growth rates, uh, top 10 countries of GDP growth, a lot of those are African countries that fit into that frontier market profile, which always kind of surprised me that they had such sort of higher ranking GDP growth year over years. Um, and that's where some of this is, is happening as well. Uh, but again, uh, it's, uh, then I have to step back to kind of a longer trend line and say, okay, so if, that, if that's occurring, where is it occurring? And that's, for me, that's where it kind of breaks down. I know that I have the depth and knowledge to kind of pinpoint where it's fallen apart for now or where it's starting to happen and it point to that. Um, yeah. And on that, have you, have you done any work to see where revenues of the, the holdings that you have are, are coming from? Because I've, I've heard this argument that yeah. you, we, we talked about virtually middle class, but you invest in Samsung. Uh, right. It, it, it's really more <laughs> developed. Yeah, we don't, we don't do any, we don't have any fundamental work, so right. you know, I'd have to sort of mine uh, some data to see that. Other than to say, um, you know, sort of by, by our, our structure in our portfolio, uh, just because we're going to be, this thing's kind of slow to do that, but we're going to systematically underweight kind of the big developed emerging countries. Um, so we've got big underweights to China, you know, Korea, Taiwan, and some of these that are going to, be some of the bigger, more globally integrated countries and companies. So we've got an underweight to Korea, we've got a big underweight to Samsung, let's say. Um, and then as we kind of, you know, and so you're going to get some bigger global companies, um, probably more so up into here, that are going to have revenues that are going to probably be very meaningful into developed parts of the world, right? Um, and that would be sort of the flip of that is to say, if I'm an international manager, I can buy all the Samsung I want. You know, from, from a profitability or revenue standpoint, a lot of it's coming to my part of my universe, right? Um, but I think, you know, as we start to get out more of these companies and more of these are, are much less, are more domestic oriented and, and maybe regionally oriented. Um, so I think by structure, we're probably eased, easing off quite a bit of the global revenue streams in a lot of these companies. Um, that, that would be my hunch. Yeah. So is this all direct share ownership in the local market, or do you use other tools to gain, gain manager exposure? Yeah, that's a good question. The, we own a lot of securities in the strategy, so we want to try to capture this country aspect. Um, so all in, we have about 1,500 to 1,600 securities in the portfolio. Uh, the, the dominant of source of that are the locals that we have. So. You know, we like, you know, kind of liquidity and, and volume, transaction costs come into play. So as we go country by country, if they've got an ADR, uh, if they've got a GDR, we may use that. Uh, for example, um, the, Argen the Argentine exposure we have there, our trading is ADRs. That's where we've got our exposure. So we, we're very liquid, very transaction oriented that we can be in, in Argentina, for example, even though it's down in tier four. Uh, frontier market area. Um, and, uh, you know, our Russian holdings, we've got some on, uh, you know, sort of Russian locals, but we also have GDRs that trade out of, out of the London exchange. So it, it, it's predominantly locals, but we've got some ADRs and GDRs. Uh, we don't have any ETF exposure. Um, and for the moment in Saudi Arabia, we have an on occasion participation link note. So we've got counterparties that give us a swap. It gives us the Saudi Arabian equity exposure till we get our QV in place and, and can go to locals there. And in the past, we've had some in India's tougher registration. We've had P notes there in the past. 
And going way back, we've had, I think, Gazprom and Pino back in the early, like, mid-90s or so. Yeah? Sort of as a follow-up to that, um, do you have, when you're in a country, assuming your country weight, even though it's less than the, or it's different from the Morgan yeah. Stanley, right? yes. yeah. um, but are the individual company weights and stock weights mirroring that, or are they different because of liquidity reasons or some sort of a, I know you're not funny, you is some right. other reason that, that, that you yeah. have different exposures to companies. Yeah, the, uh, that's a good So in terms of like our, our, our stock weightings relative to the MSA emerging market, so our benchmark, our bogey for performance, the MSCI index, um, our, our viable universe, we use the S&P broad market indices, the BMIs, uh, emerging frontier in Saudi Arabia. <coughs> BMI goes lower. They think they've got about a 75 to 100 million dollar market cap, uh, and they're much more inclusive than MSCI. So that universe of stocks all in is about 5,000 stocks. MSCI's index is about 840 or something right now. So we've got a lot more names. Uh, let's say, and we'll pick on Brazil again. But if we go into Brazil to get our, our positioning, um, there's the MSCI weights in a particular Brazil sector. Let's say. And we'll look at what our BMI, kind of that composite viable universe weights are, and look to own sort of the cap-weighted uh, exposures uh, of those stocks within that BMI kind of composite index. So we'll start buying the largest, most liquid names up to that weight that, that, that our sort of our viable universe weight would show. And that'll be different than the MSCI emerging market weight for, for the index uh, constituent. And then we'll probably have a group of names that are out of benchmark that'll be more mid and probably small cap uh, to fill out that, let's say, country sector exposure. And then we'll do that sector by sector within each country and, uh, and do that country by country so that we've got a lot more stock exposure and we'll have quite a bit of out of benchmark. Obviously, all the frontier market holdings are all out of benchmark uh, and are looking to target that BMI weight. Does that give you an understanding? So we'll have different than index weights and out of benchmark uh, holdings too. Yep. Question. From, from a global standpoint, uh, obviously the objective is to outperform, uh, and you can outperform by trying to, you know, buy alpha, or you can outperform by trying to avoid risk. What? What does your work say the best use of emerging markets is? Mm -hmm. Is it to try and you know figure out these are going to be my uh, stars and my winners and my my great alpha, or is emerging market really going to try and benefit me by protecting on the downside? Well, um, from from our from from where I sit at Parametric, you know, I think that we've that we take the approach of, 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 of delivering what we think is a very effective core EM exposure. Um, we're gonna give you what we think is a very broad uh, coverage of the opportunity set. So we've got, you know, really we've got kind of placement in all these countries. Um, we're there if Pakistan goes up 100% next year. MSCI is probably gonna announce that Pakistan is gonna get promoted up into the EM index. So we're there. If something happens that those markets go up, we can capture that. So we think we've got kind of a better exposure and, and more diverse exposure into this space. And we think our you know, structure and the rebalancing can add value to the index. Um, if you like that, you know, and, and some clients say, hey, that's what I want. I love the frontier markets. I want to have something there and, and parametric will give that to me all packaged up into one strategy. Uh, you know, if that fits their thesis, I think we've got a really effective offering. Um, but I go to finals presentations and my job is to have to flip the whole committee's thinking because they're thinking inefficiency and they're thinking we've got a manager that's going to have an information edge that's going to, you know, beat the index by five, six hundred basis points if they're doing their job right. And, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for that too. Um, but that's a different mindset for that committee that's saying, hey, we want to spend our risk budget in our EM allocation, and we're willing to take the risk um, for underperformance for a manager that convinces us they've got you know, repeatable process to, to ferret out the, the, the gems that can, that can win and, and have high conviction. Um, you know, that works, that clearly works too. Uh, but I would say our, you know, 
my parametric views, we've got a, a nice exposure here for beating the benchmark. You know, if we're a couple hundred over the benchmark over time, we've got really good rolling three-year performance. We've got, and we've got very nice downside capture in that, you know, when these big countries tend to lead the way down, uh, and we get a little bit of cushion from the frontier markets in a big global decline like, oh wait, we outperformed. We're still long only equity. We're not gonna shock someone but we tend to outperform in a downside capture. If that's compelling, that's, that's something that we tend to do pretty well as well. Um, but, you know, based on our, our, on our you know, so, so active has its day as well. Um, yeah. Uh, does investing in the emerging market involves shorting stocks or just uh, all the strategies long equity that's well? Because yeah, I see that uh, most of the countries, the shorting possibility is very low. You cannot short due to and a lot of countries have a different standards because if someday the stock goes up 5%, then there's an upper cap of the stock, so you cannot uh, invest more in that. So how you manage such this? Yeah, that, we haven't, to my knowledge, explored uh, sort of a long, short <coughs> a vehicle or approach into the emerging markets. So I'm not really versed on what uh, the implications are there other than um, you know, there may be some impediments, kind of like you're saying, to effectively be able to be liquid and to borrow stock in some of these markets could be real challenging. But I'm not real, I don't have a whole lot to offer on that. Yeah. Do you hedge currencies or it's all that's trade a good, currency risk only? That's a good question. We don't, we don't hedge the currency. Um, we've, uh, I guess we could say it's, it's uh, all pain, no gain. <laughs> um, you know, when when you think of hedging, so you've got um, you've got opportunities in, in, in international markets for hedging. Um, as you start to get into the emerging markets, um, some of these countries don't really have a vehicle to, to do to affect that. And again, it's very costly. Um, and we've done some analysis on on hedging. There's you know, it ends up being somewhat of a push. You're going to get a nice currency effect in some situations for being unhedged and reverse. And then it folds back to us to say, well, do we have the expertise to know when to put the trade on and when to take it off and, and for that to sort of add value? And when we've analyzed that relative to kind of what we think we get for excess return, we tend to come back to not hedging. So we, we kind of lump that into the, into the country return. Yeah? Uh, Jan, for the uh, ETF. We have 40 ACT. Uh, we have 40 ACT funds E, uh, E, EIEMX, I believe. There's, there's a couple that we have. We have one that's tax managed. That's EIT, uh, EX, I believe. And then there's another one that uh, is, I believe it's EIEMX, very close to that. The E is Eaton Vance owns us. That's kind of what the E is, I think, still on the ticker. What did you say the ticker for this strategy right here? Yeah, it should be EIEMX. Let's try that. <laughs> and uh, give me a minute. Give me a minute afterwards. You're in sales, right? I know. <laughs> I'm an institutional portfolio manager. <laughs> um, but it's very close to that. That's, we can Google it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't have that off the top of my head. Um, yes. Kind of two questions. One. Back to the query about alpha versus kind of a structured risk portfolio, wouldn't most institutional clients do both? I mean, it wouldn't really be an either or yeah. question. It would be a blend yes. of both strategies. Yes. Um, and then secondly, and I'm not saying I believe in reversion to the main tendencies, but if you're not hedged back into US dollars, given where the dollar has been but probably may be going in the future, wouldn't that probably work to your advantage? I, I mean, it would seem yes. like if you're buying in US dollars, yes. and the dollar goes down from this, okay. Right, so we would, you know, if we've had a big headwind being back in the US dollar, historically the last few years at least, we get a tailwind if that starts to reverse. And so it kind of, um, I, we just did a piece that sort of, it's called um, all pain, no gain. And one of the charts in there looks at it, an EM hedged versus unhedged result over time. And it really does kind of has a real cyclicality to it. Who knows what those inflection points are, but hindsight, it kind of, you kind of round trip it at some point. Um, so yeah, I would say we would get a tailwind of that. Um, 
and we do have, uh, I specifically have clients that have pair us with exactly. a concentrated active manager that's going to sort of fill in. It's almost like we're a puzzle piece. We're very stable. I come back year after year and, and it's somewhat predictable in terms of our results. We, we do move things. We do have countries moving tiers. We are sort of thinking about our process. We make tweaks on it, but sort of from, you know, if you sort of squint, our, our, our positioning is fairly stable and other uh, clients, if they like what we do, they'll throw, you know, active, concentrated, or manager kind of with us and uh, tends to be a decent compliment. That manager, lo and behold, tends to traffic more in, in, in some of the bigger EM and, and we provide the tail uh, is somehow some of the thing. That's a great question. No, we haven't. Um, and so, right, is the uh, is the sort of engine of growth the developed country movements, and that's contingent on EM producing growth. In other words, do we need to have a real effective global uh, recovery for the developed countries, which we've been struggling with before the EM is unlocked to to continue? Um, that's a great question, um, and I think that's another, you know, one that, that uh, and we haven't done work on that. Um, some folks do look at GDP growth and say, you know, I've heard both sides of that argument in terms of GDP growth is not really correlated to equity returns, and I've heard the other side of that argument as well. Um, so that debate goes on. Um, you know, so can we, can we see EM growth in a low growth global market? Maybe that's the question. And um, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Thank you, Greg. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much today.